Okay. This is Jody Tropiano, the content director for health, and I'm here with Dr. John Cohen, the executive chairman of BioReference. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Nice to chat with you too. And being that BioReference is the nation's third largest clinical laboratory, we'll focus a lot of our conversation on COVID serolo ser serology and regular testing, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Yep. Awesome. So First off, if you could kind of share with our audience some of the complexities around serology testing and kind of clear up any misconceptions that may be out there right now. Sure. So there's been a lot of um, a bad press uh, uh, around serology testing uh, because of the point of care, which are devices where you test someone right on location. Uh, and some of them are uh, finger, finger sticks. You know, you prick your finger, and then you do the, the blood. It's almost like a pregnancy test. And, the reliability of those tests has always been uh, up in the air relative to some more very highly sophisticated tests. So unfortunately, the, the, the press around it has been really negative because they are you know, not as reliable as real, as real blood tests that are done when you draw somebody's blood and then you run the serum. So the, the testing that we're running at BioReference is a blood draw, and it's almost 100% accurate in terms of sensitivity and specificity to uh, to COVID-19, uh, to specifically COVID-19. There are multiple coronaviruses, and what you want to do is have a test that only tests for COVID-19 with no cross-reactivity, and that's, that's what we run. And what we do is we report out on somebody's antibodies levels. They're called IgG. There are different types of antibodies. Uh, there's IgM, IgA, but the one we're testing for is called IgG, which is uh, associated usually with a level of immunity. Uh, for a particular disease. So that's actually what we're testing for. Great. And some of those finger prick tests that are getting a lot of attention in the news now, they're not as accurate, correct? If you can that's share correct. a little bit. Okay. So what level of accuracy do you predict those will be around? Uh, I've seen a lot of variation. I've seen anywhere from 20 to 70 to 80%. Wow. I, I just, I, they're very variable. There's a lot of them on the market right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been the problem. Uh, yeah. some people ended up buying those, using them, and got got some bad results. So the sure thing is really the the full blood draw. Correct. Yeah, that's that's really the the standard of which we, we and we do viral testing all the time. We do hepatitis, we do HIV, AIDS, etc. So we're always doing viral testing. So the the testing for this this kind of disease is not new in and of itself. Um, so we're used to these kind of issues, and and all of them are blood draws. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. So just switching gears to the overall testing strategy in the US, where do you think we're on the right path? Where do you think we need to make changes? Any kind of information you can share about that would be helpful. Sure, so I've been telling people that the, the testing for antibodies is what I call the next step in the evolution of this pandemic. We're not gonna get all the information you want, where there's gonna be a lot of questions about the data, but it will provide valuable data for a lot of different uh, a lot of different people, a lot of different segments of the population. So for instance, one, it, it can identify people who are potentially plasma donors for, for the disease. Second, the epidemiology data can be very important in terms of at-risk populations, where there are pockets of disease that are higher than others, which people are front-facing or frontline workers, what the impact of the disease has been on them. Um, it also uh, will give people, I call, a, a sense of somewhat psychological security. I don't, I'm not gonna say whether there is immunity or high degree of immunity or whether you could get sick again, but for most people, if you ask, if they get tested positive for the antibody, they do feel better about knowing that they've been exposed and they have some degree of protection, whatever that is. So I think that's a big impact on people. I mean, I, I can tell you, anecdotally, I tell people I got tested, I'm negative, I'm sort of really annoyed about that. I <laughs> thought I would be positive and it would give me a little bit different look and going out doing the things I would still do the same things I'm doing in terms of social distancing and wearing a mask, but I think it would have made me feel a little bit better if I was, mm -hmm. if I was positive. There could be an impact on the vaccine um, in terms of you know, how we distribute the vaccine maybe eventually or which pockets or at-risk populations maybe, uh, maybe get it before other people. I'm not sure, but, uh, but these are some of the issues that people are talking about. And the last one, of course, is employers and employees. So we're getting a lot of calls from a lot of employers and they're saying, well, what do I do? And if we test positive, if you test positive, can those people go back to work? And if you test negative, should they not go back to work? Or... So I think every individual employer is gonna treat the data differently. Mm -hmm. 
and we'll give them some valuable information depending on how front facing their individual employees are. So I tell people there's, there's, there's a grocery chain that, that I know of and you know, we were talking to them and you know, their view was is if they knew that you know, 30 of their 150 workers were positive for antibodies, they might put those people on the register as opposed to the other people. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, and they're not saying that's right or wrong, but it does give them some path to how they may treat their employees differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're hearing a lot about employers that are using testing as part of their back to work strategy. So with that, when do you think that testing will be at the scale we need it to be to actually send people back to work? Confidently. We're, uh, we're, we're scaling right now, uh, by reference is, uh, um, is scaling right now to do uh, about 260,000 tests every day. Wow. So it's a lot. And, and actually we also have the ability to increase our capacity to 400,000 a day. So uh, the capacity on the antibody testing is much, much greater than the PCR um, viral testing that's been going on now, you know, to determine whether or not you have the active virus or not. So up to now, we've been doing all the swabs and it's called PCR testing and you test for the virus. And that's been significantly limited based on capacity for a lot of different reasons. The antibody testing, uh, for that, we have much more capacity and the ability to test quicker and faster. And so will most employers go right to the antibody testing and kind of skip over I think the it's, COVID yeah, testing? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I mean, uh, we're getting conversations with some who want to do antibody testing for their, all their employees. Some want to continue to test on the PCR uh, swab to see who's actively infected. Mm -hmm. Again, it depends on the business, right? It depends on how much front facing you are. I, I tell people all the time, I, we have almost 4,000 employees at BioReference and we have a call center with probably 300 people. They're relatively isolated. They're not front facing, but I think, you know, if I knew that a lot of those people were antibody positive, um, the ones that were not, I think we would try and figure out how to make that group function better. But on the other hand is that, you know, we have people who are frontline workers actually. And I, I think those are, those type of employees probably get treated differently. Mm -hmm. And kind of expanding on the frontline workers. I know you have a partnership with the city of New York to test a lot of essential employees, both Metro workers, healthcare workers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we have a partnership with uh, the state of New York and, and New York City. Uh, we are looking to test a, a bunch of frontline workers. Uh, they they want to see the uh, predominance of the, the incidence of the disease and, and how many workers are actually test positive. So we tested, we, we started testing last week, the MTA, the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority, which as you know, is the is the bus operators and the train operators, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, the uh, Tribor Authority, et cetera. Um, and we're looking at those employees to see what their, what their results are gonna be and, and if they're different between the groups. Um, and then we're gonna roll it out to multiple other employee groups across the state and across the city. Mm -hmm. And are they using you guys to help with contact tracing once those initial tests are already done? Right, no, we, we're not, we don't, we don't do contract, but we don't do contact tracing. We're not in that business. That's, that's up to the city state and probably Mayor Bloomberg. Oh, <laughs> what, <right. laughs> what I can yeah. hear. Yeah. yeah. So. And so um, another partnership that I've read about recently is uh, yours with Rite Aid for drive through testing centers. So how right. is that coming along and do you have plans to roll it out with any other larger retailers? So, um, yeah, we established a, a partnership with Rite Aid. Uh, I think we've rolled out at least um, 25. We're going to increase that number significantly over the next several weeks. And what Rite Aid is doing is you go into Rite Aid and you, they actually watch you swab yourself. It's a self-swab, but it's, it, but it's watched by a medical professional so that you do it the right way. One of the biggest problems we've had is, is up until recently, it's been very difficult to find a, a a swab that people can reliably do use to swab themselves to test for. So the Rite Aid gives us the ability to have people get scheduled, come in, um, in their drive through uh, get swabbed with somebody monitoring. It also helps the medical professional because they don't have to actually do the swabbing themselves, which puts them at much low, at a much lower risk. Um, so that partnership started a couple of weeks ago and will continue to, to expand. We are also, as you may have read, we're also still uh, doing the testing for upwards of drive-throughs around the country. That includes uh, multiple cities, including Miami and Florida, mm -hmm. and the 
Florida, Detroit, um, 15 of the 21 counties in New Jersey, and multiple, multiple sites across New York State. That's great. And also you were on the White House task force, correct? No, I was at, no, I was at, the, I was at the, the first meeting that the vice president had with a couple of the industry leaders uh, back in uh, the first week in March. Seems like three years ago now, but it was, uh, uh, yes, we did meet uh, with several of the industry leaders with, uh, with Vice President Pence uh, and uh, uh, Ambassador Bricks and, and several of the, the White House senior staff. We also met with HHS, uh, the HHS Secretary, uh, FDA Director, and the CDC Director. Um, it was really the kickoff uh, as we began to look at what we to deliver as much testing as possible across the country. That's great. And what was the sentiment like there? I imagine it's quite different now, but. It's, it's very different as you look back now. Um, you know, we were all, we were all continue to be all very committed to providing as much testing as possible for, for as many people as possible in the country. Uh, I think everybody was, was first their, um, their feet wet in terms of figuring out what to do, what the capacity was, how we were going to deliver it, how we were going to deliver all the swabs and swabbing. Um, so it was very early on compared to, uh, compared to where we are now. It's been yeah. a very, very long uh, 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we've been reading a lot about the supply chain challenges with the swabs and reagents. Right. Do you think that's been kind of more streamlined in recent weeks and will continue to be? I think it's better. Uh, we, uh, we, like everybody, had supply chain issues, mm -hmm. reagents, supplies. We've solved a lot of it. I think the swab issue is better. I don't know if I would say it's completely solved, but it's better than it was. Uh, reagents depends on which platforms you're running. We're mul running what we call multiple different types of machines. So it depends on which one of our analyzers slash machines are working fast enough and what their reagent need is. So we're always balancing people. It, it's, a, it's a fairly complex environment to run four different types of platforms uh, every day. We're doing upwards of 25 thousand tests a day will be 35,000 within the next, actually within the next several days, and then we're going to scale to 40,000 a day. Um, but there's a, it's, it's 24 seven for the lab staff. Um, and, uh, and a lot of, a lot of operational issues that needed to be addressed and continue to need to be addressed to actually pull this off. Mm -hmm. And as we scale up even more, what do you think the bigger challenges will be? Do you think those will go away? New ones will pop up? I think that the, uh, um, I think more people will do more, some of the small labs will do some more testing. I don't know how much that'll contribute to the national capacity. Um, I think each different entity has a little bit different of an issue. The, the universities, state laboratories, um, and the hospitals will only get up to a certain point because there's just so much they could do because it's not what they do every day. Meaning, you know, we could scale to 35, 40,000, the hospital will never do that because they have other priorities like taking care of patients. So, so there'll be a lot of people doing a lot of testing. I can't tell you exactly what that number will be in the next several months. Um, our challenge has been more analyzes, which we're beginning to solve. So, but I think everybody's challenge is a little bit different. It's not one solution for everybody. Mm -hmm. And just predictions for the future. Where do you think we'll be in one month, two months, three months, as far out as, yeah. as we can predict? Well, well first of all, I, I don't have, I probably know pretty much as much as you do about vaccines and there is what's happening. I don't know how soon that'll happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I do think there will be a lot of testing going forward. I think that the, the, there is a huge desire to continue to test people on the active virus, the PCR side especially on the going back to work and are people affected. And I think there's obviously going to be a continued issue relative to, you know, trains, planes, and airplanes uh, and ships and how you test people before they get into these environments. That will be an ongoing issue. I think that people will continue to have antibody testing. It won't just be one and done. It'll be multiple times that you'll probably get tested over the course of the next six months to the year at least. Um, so I think we're in for the, the longer haul on the testing side. I, you know, I would love to tell you it's not going to happen, quite honestly, that there'd be a vaccine, but I, I just don't know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And just maybe a silver lining of all this, you probably worked with a lot of players in the health ecosystem in new ways. How do you think that this will really fundamentally change some of those relationships? 
Um, I think telemedicine is a big deal. Uh, I think the telemedicine was here before this started. I think it's gotten a huge jump start as a result of this. Uh, I don't think we'll ever go back mm -hmm. to using telemedicine to a significant degree. Um, I think for us, uh, we've uh, we always were a national player. We serve all 50 states, but I think for my reference itself, we've we've become much more part of the national consciousness in terms of uh, who we are and, and what our ability. I, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next flu season. I think COVID-19 will be probably part of the, you know, flu workups in the future. And um, I don't know what will happen for a lot of front-facing businesses like restaurants, et cetera. You live in New York City. I, I have a place in New York City. I, I don't know what happens in New York City. Hopefully it'll come back relatively quickly. So I, there's a, I unfortunately would tell you there's a lot of unknowns right now. Mm -hmm. An evolving story. It is evolving story, and uh, I do hope that New York comes back soon. As you know, it's it's a little eerie, right, walking around the empty streets. It is very eerie. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you for for joining us today. Really appreciate all the work that you guys are doing on the front lines, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you maybe again in a, another couple months and see where we're at then. Thanks very much, Jody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching this interview. We're doing our best to keep our health community up to date and informed as the pandemic progresses. So please check back for more interviews and blog pieces with leading health experts, as well as check out our health COVID resource page for more information. Thanks again.